Welcome to the Time for a Reset podcast, the podcast where I, Paul Frampton, interview senior marketeers on the big issues of the day and the thing that they want to see reset uh, with an ever-changing landscape. Welcome back to another episode of Time for a Reset. I'm your host, Paul Frampton, and today I am delighted uh, to be joined by Jack Kingsliff, who's the CMO of KFC in the UK. And Jack and I have met a number of times, and I've seen Jack on stage many times, and I'm really interested to talk to him about how KFC strategy has changed over the years, but also kind of connecting on some of the kind of key topics that are kind of bubbling up around uh, kind of marketing right now, whether that's cost of living and inflation, or on the other end, data technology and loyalty. So welcome, Jack. Lovely to have you. Great to see you again, Paul. Thank you for having me on. Delighted to have you. So I think you know where we usually start. We start with the big reset question of if you had a magic big red button and you could change something overnight in the marketing industry, what would it be? Well, I I would love to hit the reset button on the fight for customer data and loyalty. Great. So maybe you could unpack that a little bit for us. I mean, there are many different aspects to that on there. There's the, the data piece, which is erupted over the last decades. There's the customer kind of CRM part of it. I guess marketing technology is also a part of it. But which aspects are really key to you? Is it, is it, is it more about the customer and the reward or, or something else? I think that what we're increasingly seeing is this connection and a demand from brands that, that as we demand data, we also demand loyalty through the same mechanisms. So a loyalty scheme is simultaneously designed to capture all of this data from our customers, whilst at the same time, encourage them to visit more frequently, be more engaged, or, or kind of build closer connections. And I think that what really needs to reset is the is the idea that these two things are are simultaneous goals that can be delivered through the same mechanisms. Um, mm-hmm. Naturally, the fight for data is critical. That's going to continue, and there's lots of ways that brands and advertisers can um, can address that. And loyalty, and whatever you know, however you want to define loyalty, whether it be kind of true true deep loyalty, or whether it's something that's closer to habits frequency. Um, right. That is also something that brands are naturally going to continue to work for. But it's the idea that these two things can be simultaneously delivered through some form of scheme that I think uh, I think I think could change. Yeah. Okay. Now that's a really interesting way of looking at it. And what what is it that you think is the biggest driver behind so many brands kind of now looking at some form of reward or loyalty scheme? And I mean, in in your sector, obviously. You've been doing it for a while. McDonald's has recently launched a scheme in, in the coffee space. I think, I think it's Costa uh, that have the subscription model. So is it just a race for first party data? I mean, you obviously just separated those two parts, but what's the key driver if you're a CMO? Is it to drive up LTV? Like what, what, what does KFC consider the most strategic reason to invest in loyalty? Cause loyalty is not an easy thing to get right, is it? <laughs> no. And, um, We've been really intentional about separating our, our agendas here. So at KFC, we've moved away from a stamp-based reward scheme where customers have to visit time and time again in order to collect mm-hmm. points and get some reward at the end of that to a scheme that actually allows us to capture data to tokenize trans- transactions, but through instant reward and instant gratification. And really that's about rewarding all of our customers rather than mm-hmm. just rewarding frequent customers coming in. So there's the element of how do you like, it's the value exchange there really. We're, we're asking for a scan or we're asking for an order on a digital device um, yeah. in order to receive that. There's the opportunity to win something and also the opportunity to um, participate in offers and promotions. And I think that's the difference. How we drive, I guess, connection to the brand how we mm-hmm. drive consideration for the brand and ultimately frequency is through a, a different suite of marketing activities. So I think we've right. we've sought to actually decouple those. And mm-hmm. as you said, lots and lots of brands who are, I think, playing in this space in lots of different ways. So the fight for data masquerading as loyalty is the thing that I think is going to change. But 
Right, there will be areas where, like, I think there's still an absolute need for that data. I think a couple of years ago, Tesco changed mm. their loyalty program away from this kind of points-based system yeah. to a very an immediate value exchange. If you want to participate in the best offers in Tesco, you scan your club card and you can mm. get your meal deal for three pound rather than three pound fifty or, or or whatever else it might be. And yeah. I think that like really acknowledging what the value exchange is is mm. a critical part of it. Okay. No, that's that's super interesting. And I'm assuming that from listening to some of what you said and knowing a little bit about the direction you're heading, that the, the, the broader marketing activities, the more strategic drivers behind a lot of what you're doing is so that you know <laughs> you know your customer better um, uh, through being able to identify them and know what they like and that you have got data to be able to both improve the experience, but presumably also to to drive up kind of LTV and purchase as well, right? On the, on, in, on the back end, it's not why you're doing it entirely, but presumably that is part of the strategy and why people are doing these things. Yeah, absolutely. We've got, we've got 5 million registered um, consumers now on, um, on our platform. Um, but I think fair to say we're, we're maturing, KFC is maturing in terms of um, in this place, we're not, you know, we're not necessarily leading the way at all. Um, okay. But if I kind of roll back the clock five years ago, we were solely bricks and mortar. Um, and now we are truly omnichannel, probably one of the most overused words um, is omnichannel, but we are, we're an omnichannel business. So we've got delivery, pickup, table service, kiosks, digital yeah. ordering in our restaurants, yeah. and kiosks. That's so important now. And that change has added incredible complexity to the whole organization, but particularly the marketing mm. team and how we how we react. And it's come, you know, but we've delivered that change in response to customers' preferences, what our, what our customers want and need. But as you say, it's also an opportunity, an opportunity to capture more data through that value exchange and then mm -hmm. to optimize for customer centric outcomes. So that can be anything to how fast you can order, um, mm -hmm. how much you can customize, and then also commercial outcomes to like how we drive ticket value, how we kind of drive margin. And yeah. So we, you know, we can leverage that data to deliver those kind of direct sales outcomes, but also to be better marketeers, um, delivering media more efficiently, more effectively. But I think that, you know, we've spent a ton of time capturing a lot of data historically what you then do with that is the most important thing and that's where i think we're just emerging we you know we spent a long time capturing it it's only in the last couple of years that i think we're really able to leverage that to deliver better outcomes for our customers and for our marketing efforts great no no it's great to hear that balance between improved service speed or kind of efficiency for the customer because that ultimately is quick 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 fit, quick service along with the kind of marketing agenda and it, it strikes me that you've gone on quite a journey from what I think was quite a brand kind of top down kind of build reach kind of uh, marketing business to one that, as you said, now you've got a lot of digital touch points. And of course, you still need the hero brand and you'll still do that. But you, you've also got um, presumably had to change the culture to become more data driven, to become more kind of digital first. I'd, I'd love to get a little bit of a sense of back from you as to the journey that KFC has been on in the eight years that you've been there. Yeah. So I think that, I think, the, I mean, the journey has been kind of multifaceted and we, you know, I think it's really important that as we evolve to being kind of more of a, like having a, a, a closer, more direct relationship with our customers and being able to market through, um, through digital channels to known customers that we're also still delivering high reach, um, driving emotional connections and doing that through creativity. So for me, it's absolutely a, a combination of those two things. And it's the and. And I think yeah. that first and foremost, if I think about the journey that we've been on over the last, you know, I've been, been at KFC for eight years now. Eight years ago, we were in a really different space and it's taken the whole business to to transform transform it's not just been a been the efforts of the marketing team mm -hmm. but about seven years ago we did a we did a piece of research to understand why performance was where it was where it where it was 
you know, the thing is like we weren't doing poorly, but we were lagging the competition. We were growing, but we were losing some share. Mm -hmm. um, and so just beginning to stagnate just a little bit. So we did this big bit of research and what we came to understand was that we were becoming out of touch and irrelevant as a brand in culture. The culture code of food had changed. Mm -hmm. um, consumers' expectations um, and habits had changed and the category had changed. But right. KFC, the brand, hadn't. Must have been quite um, a scary moment, wasn't it? <laughs> well, it was. I mean, like, it was... Um, it, Huge it was opportunity, a, also a little scary. Not an easy debrief to listen to when you're looking at that and thinking we are, like, we're not just a beat off, but we are actually, you know, we needed to truly transform. I mean, mm. through this, one of the things that was most helpful in the diagnosis was we had um, where quite a lot of metaphorics were used. So lots of qual with consumers as well as some, some rich quant. But in that, we, we heard the brand described as an old man who was living by himself, alone, stuck in the past, probably was a musician when he was younger and was cool. Oh. But now he's an alcoholic and he sits by himself. Like that sort of richness was yeah. I guess, helpful in painting. Not what picture. you're really going for, yeah. <laughs> but yeah, I mean, when you're in the marketing team and you're hearing that about your brand and it's not necessarily the way that you feel about it, it's, um, sure. it's pretty confronting. Yeah. But it's also, I think that there's a truth in that and facing into the truth of where we were was ultimately what we were able to, to do to move forward. And so... Yeah. We kind of embarked on this huge shift and really trying to move from being, I guess, the the poster child of what is fast food, which had all these negative connotations with it, mm. to becoming mm. something different. Um, and and we changed every facet of the organisation. So that is, so yes, we changed advertising. Um, we appointed Mother at that point. That was about mm. six years ago. And um, we ultimately changed media partnerships so that we could do different things and be more sophisticated. Um, but yeah. it's also restaurant design. It was the technology that we that we build. It's how we train our team members. It was the menu that we serve. It was every part of the the business right. needed to change. Um, and I think that at the start of that journey, it was it was very much about like how we build like confidence and pride internally mm -hmm. within the brand and then spotlight that outwardly in a way that's relevant to the category and relevant to who we are. And frankly, that's all about being the very best tasting fried chicken, you know, as you can imagine. And how that's evolved over time is whilst we still continue to do that, you know, act in a human, authentic, real way, be in touch with culture. The other shift that we need to respond to and that we're responding to now is how yeah. we remain really really easy in a super convenient world where there is um like delivery has totally tran you know transformed what it is to be a quick that service convenience yeah 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 now, um, and that's where technology plays a critical role for us now is is actually in making sure that we are like in line with and we're relevant ahead yeah. of where consumers expectations are in terms of what accessing tasty affordable food easily actually means that's great. Thank you for sharing that chat. That's really, it's really interesting to hear how you articulate that. I'm guessing that it sounds like that research was obviously done, was, was, was initiated by your team, but clearly it had to be socialized throughout the business in order for change to happen everywhere through the restaurant design and lots of other things that are not always controlled by marketing. Like how connected is marketing to the board table? What kind of priority does it get on the board agenda and, and how how do, how do you see that whole thing working because that's one of the topics we always touch on here is that there are a variety of different organizations or different models there are there's sales first marketing first product first technology first etc cetera, etc cetera. and in some orgs marketing leads everything like png and others it's like far far down the pecking order so i'm just interested in like how that how that plays out and, and, and how that impacts your role actually. Like how much of your time is marketing the business of marketing? <laughs> yeah, of course. So firstly, let me just like orientate you and your listeners like um around KFC. So obviously KFC is a global restaurant brand and we're part of a family of brands. Um um we're part of a group called Yum Brands, which includes Taco Bell, Pizza Hut, and uh, and, a, and a burger restaurant called The Habit. So in the UK 
we have um, we have over a thousand restaurants. Now, of those thousand, only fifty are owned by the brand; they're equity owned. The rest of the other nine hundred and fifty are owned by franchisees. Mm. And globally, we are actually one of the few equity markets who actually own restaurants. So, the vast majority of KFCs, but actually young brand restaurants across the globe, are owned and operated. By franchise partners you know you asked about marketing what that means is that ultimately we are a brand business that's what we're about um we don't run restaurants we run the brand now naturally we have operations teams who support um franchisees and upskill them we offer tech solutions to our franchise partners and to our, for our own restaurants in some markets and you know we'll run supply chain we'll ensure product quality we'll do all of these things but at yeah. the heart we are the brand first and foremost so mm -hmm. what i think that means for the business is that no matter what function anyone's in whether they're in finance or operations or tech like everyone across the leadership team is very aware of and connected to mm -hmm. the brand experience and the importance of putting our customers at the forefront of every decision that we make right. and building the brand for the long term because that's ultimately what we need to do in order to create an investable model for our franchisees mm -hmm. sure yeah so what i'd say is that marketing therefore i think in a really positive way infiltrates all parts of the organization and therefore when we come to the board table and having a conversation i don't have a you know a great you know a great responsibility to market the role of marketing to talk about the need to in invest in the brand. That's something that I see coming through in a really positive way, challenges from all of my colleagues. And so I think that's that, that connection is really there. So I think I find myself very fortunate to work, to work in an organization where marketing, not only um, is it kind of respected, but actually it's and, and valued, but it's also genuinely kind of yeah, like baked into the in, Yeah. Yeah, no, 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 that's helpful. And like, wh where would you say the kind of newest, deepest discipline relationships are developed for you around that board? Because obviously, as you said, the, the business has changed a lot. The, the nature of how you provide your provide fried chicken to people has changed through, through the delivery aggregators, through kiosks, et cetera, et cetera. So there's a, there's a lot of shift there. So I'm sure technology and IT is important, but are there, are there, are there things, are there, teams or people that you spend more time with as a CMO than you, that you didn't in the past? And how's that changing the way that you're working as a marketer? Yeah, well, so, I mean, great question. I mean, we naturally working very collaboratively and very cross-functionally, but I think the shifts that I've experienced over my sort of tenure is when I, you know, when I was marketing director, um, the connection between marketing and operations was probably the single most critical partnership that I had. Uh -huh. And that's because one, like I kind of, I often say like as marketeers, we make the promise and then the operations team deliver that promise. And we need to make sure that we deliver the promise that the marketing team make, you know, we're responsible for menu innovation, all of those mm -hmm. things that ultimately the operations team deliver in restaurant every single day. So we need to make sure that what we do is not adding unnecessary complexity into the restaurant, that our teams can deliver that brilliantly for all of our customers. And so that connection in what we launch, when we launch it, how we launch it between marketing and ops was absolutely critical. That's where we spent yes. like, all of our time debating. That remains the case. So that's really close. But what has shifted is the role now that technology plays in that customer experience. So because um, rather than going to a till and placing an order, far more orders are now placed through a digital device than, than otherwise. The interaction is with a piece of technology and not with a person. Um, the way in which you explore and navigate a menu is through a piece of technology, not a menu board that sits above the till. And so that connection with the tech team has become, you know, it's really, really transformed over the last three years. Naturally, that's, you know, as I say, because of what the customer experience is like, but it's also because of the the tactics, the tools that we're using to deliver the commercial mm -hmm. outcomes that that we need to. So, um, we were talking earlier about the need to like customize and like how that can deliver you know, better outcomes. But frankly, as well, like just the relationship that 
technology have with data capture and how we then leverage that data capture in internal yeah. marketing mix as well. So I know it's a bit of a, it's probably the most expected and most boring answer I could give, but it is our partnership with the tech team that has shifted so dramatically. No, 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 I don't, no, I don't think it is at all. And I actually, I, li- I liked your, the way you sh- talked about operations and telling, obviously operations has continued to stay important, but it's the and, as you said earlier, that technology has now got to be in almost every conversation, tech and data. Always. Exactly. It's the trifactor. It's the, it's the three of us together because it's not marketing and tech and marketing and ops. It's the three yeah. teams coming right. together because naturally that technology, you know, if we were having this conversation with, with my ops partner, Lucy, who's an amazing human being who I get to work with every day, she'd be talking about technology back of house, <laughs> yeah, like plug for Lucy. She'd be talking about technology back of house and how that's helping our teams like do their yeah. jobs better. And yeah. so, and that connection naturally flows through over the counter to the customer as well. Yeah, no, 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 absolutely. And what I think is quite interesting, and you and I have touched on this before, is is how I think the proximity of those relationships between tech and marketing and ha- has led to you adopting like ways of using agile within your marketing team, which a, a lot of marketers are a little bit fearful of because um, they, they don't want to work in a kind of too constricted kind of straitjacket way. But um, I know we've talked about it before. I'd, I'd love to maybe touch on that a little bit because I think the last time we spoke, you, you, you were actually able to almost not perfectly, but quantify some some revenue gain from having adopted that type of hypothesis, run experiments, optimized type of approach. So could you share like a few words on that? Yeah, of course. And I can understand why many marketers are fearful because we've been running at some of this and I remain fearful and conflicted as well as we do it, but there's absolutely benefit there. So when we think about true agile, so how we organize and work with you know, design teams, brief them and empower them to deliver mm-hmm. outcomes. We started that um, in 2020. So towards the back end of 2020, as if we had nothing else going on. Um, <laughs> just to do that. And through that, we ran a series of agile performance streams across, across different verticals. So we had them across menu management, across advertising, and media, CRM and ran like a, a, a very fixed term sprint project. We were able to, through experiments, validate a series of optimizations that we then put in place in 2021 that delivered an incremental 80 million pounds of revenue. And we were able to directly attribute all of that incrementality to those work streams. So. We absolutely were able to make the use case for that. I think where we've where we've struggled, or frankly, where 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 we're delivering, yeah. you know, where marketing working in an agile way with tech's been less successful for us has been in, in actually delivering products and features as we as we build new platforms. And so we kind of work like reviewing and continue to think about our ways of working around the role that agile plays from a marketing standpoint in delivering yeah. features and, and products. But I think the fact is that from an optimization standpoint, when you've got a live product, it's been phenomenal for us and we continue to do that. And then mm. we also then apply um, a lot of that mindset, maybe not in a true agile way, but mm. if I think about test and learn, flexibility, um, you know, being adaptable, absolutely that becomes like, really important how we work um, from a marketing standpoint. So we're about to, enter into a big a big campaign for the world cup and mm. as part of that very exciting we've got a winter world cup we've got we've had two failed christmases people are going to be at home and they're going to want to indulge in spite mm. of you know all of the madness and pressures that are going on yeah. i think that you know i think that we're going to want to make something of this christmas so uh, what we know is when the football's on delivery sales skyrocket and so you know we're going to be running campaign and driving KFC awareness, visibility, and then performance media around the World Cup. But what we also know is our restaurants are going to be under exceptional pressure through that. The only thing worse than like being off sale or not communicating is giving our customers a really poor experience. So it's really like, and we will be hitting these super peaks where over a very short period of time, the pressure on our restaurants will be massive. And we want to make sure that we're giving customers a great experience. And what that means is we need to be able to manage our media in really effective ways so that we're not, you know, when restaurants are under pressure, we're not streaming a whole load of sales to that individual restaurant. 
So we are working with Mindshare, our media partners, um, on like a programmatic tool, which allows us to be incredibly flexible and not just across digital channels, but across out of home and audio channels too. And yeah. what that will allow us to do is, is actually be, be reviewing how yeah. media is performing. Back, put ads back. Sales, yeah, yeah. And then do change, that. Change really by location. Will, will you take it as far as changing by location where there is pressure or, or is it? Yeah. So that will all be like, that'll be location oriented. As I say, like location, not just on digital, but also on out of home and audio, which is what I'm so excited. That's the first time that yeah, we've nice. done something that's so sophisticated in, in that respect. And and through that, testing and learning our way in, forward into what that means next year. Now, that's not been delivered through true agile, but it absolutely has the spirit of test and learn, sure. flexibility and adaptability. Sure. No, no, no. And uh what I've seen when it comes to Agile is that it's difficult to, like, for any marketing team to entirely um, adopt it. You need to find your own kind of version of it. And a lot of it, as you said, is like, moving beyond just using the adjectives as moving fast, which some people do. It's like, yeah, we just move quicker. Um, it, it, it's the adaptability, the data-driven aspect of it. It's being clear on what you've learned and when you've learned it and how to make a decision. So I love that. I love that idea around uh, how you're playing differently with your media because it would be much it would be much easier not to do that. But programmatic is not just about digital. That the technology obviously can fuel, in principle, that technology can kind of shift and change decisions on content or advertising on any platform. It's just most people don't really think about it like that. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I feel like I've spent you know the last five years being soul dream sometimes Do you know what i mean like it's like it's like anything's possible but yet when it comes to the crunch and you're actually trying to build it into a scale program it doesn't quite yes. kind of land as you as you think it might but i actually think I, like for me at least in my kind of in my limited world like, i really feel like now we're beginning to see the mm, future yeah. is, is actually happening we're really able to leverage like the the opportunity in a, in a, in a truly meaningful way yeah no that, that's great and I, I've also spoken to many marketers that talk about, yeah, we, we like the idea of personalization. Keep it as a loose one, but it's got to be personalization at scale. Otherwise, it's a rather pointless exercise for a business like yours or a CPG brand it's like, or a beer brand. I mean, yeah, you want personalization, but not to, to 100,000 people. That's not particularly helpful in the long term. Look, Jack, we could probably talk about all of this for, for hours, but I'm conscious that we should probably um, start taking it towards a conclusion. So, I mean, we, we started by talking about loyalty. We've then talked about how KFC's evolved um, as a brand and the kind of operations, marketing, technology triumvirate has come together. M more of a focus on improving the experience through technology and data and loyalty, as well as getting smarter to be able to ultimately get people to return and kind of come back more regularly. Uh, and then how you've taken kind of things like Agile into uh, how, to, how you go to market. So there's, I think there's a great, uh, a lot of learning and insight in there for people. If you were to give one piece of advice, either to a young marketer or a, <laughs> some more seasoned marketer that's listening, like what, what's the one thing that's sticking in your head at the moment? You're like, I really wish I told more people this. If, if I was mentoring people, I would tell them this. I do often, you know, I do talk to this and my, I think the most critical thing for us as marketers is to ensure that we're seeking out diversity and diversity of thought. I believe that great marketers come in all shapes and sizes um, and that there is, a, there is a balance within marketing of the art and the science. We need technology, but we also need commerciality and we also need creativity. All of those things, you know, like some people have a little bit of all of those things. Some people over index on one or the other. But that diversity and bringing all of that together is the most important thing. And we've, we've talked a lot about like technology and programmatic and personalization mm. but i can't just see like a whole load of communications that say like this is to men of this age in wimbledon who do like who work in marketing like it is creativity and and that that which sparks something within us an emotion that then also needs the science of efficiency effectiveness etc so i think that that diversity of thought the diversity of people coming together is is critical. And I talk about my own experiences because I didn't kind of grow up in a marketing background. I started my career in sales. So yeah. I did customer facing sales. I did commercial planning. 
And then I kind of fell into marketing. Yeah. And I believe the fact that I wasn't a brand manager, then a marketing manager, I didn't grow up through that. I, and I had a different experience makes me a better marketer today. Yeah, absolutely. Um, absolutely. And I, I think that people, it's not necessary to come through a marketing education and then that sort of that sort of training. That said, I mean, like, you know, marketing training is really important. There is some science, there are some factual elements of marketing that are true and that need to be learned and known, but there are also other elements of the marketing mix that that come through different experiences. And so I would my, my advice to anyone is that if that if that's a path you want to follow, I don't want I don't think anyone should close off their expertise that a marketeer or a CMO needs yeah. to look or be a certain way. I don't think that's the case at all. Well said, well said. Um, and I think it's great for people to hear that um, because I think often um, if people people think the path to CMOs is you have to go through those steps that you talked about. Um, and I, I, I actually, as the older I get, the more I think actually if you start in sales or recruitment, it sets you up quite nicely for, for most careers because you learn, you learn the hustle um, and you learn to do things that are genuinely hard and to influence people and those skills are exceptionally helpful in most businesses and they definitely are good foundations for marketeers from what I've seen. Not always, but most of the time. So look, Jack, all that remains is for me to thank you for your time. Um, as always, it's a pleasure chatting to you and we could have gone on for probably another half an hour, but we probably should bring it to a close. Um, so thank you for making the time and uh, see you very soon. Thank you so much, Ben, Ron. Great to see you again. Thanks for tuning in to another episode of Time for a Reset. I hope you enjoyed this one as much as I did. We'll be back talking to a senior marketeer very soon. Make sure you don't miss out on any new episodes by subscribing on Apple, Spotify or SoundCloud and leave us a review at timeforareset.co.uk. 